Anyway, um, I'm so glad to be here as part of the conversation about the road to Christ. You know, as an elder, one of the things that we seek to do is to build people up. We want the things that we say to people to build people up. And I thought about this because uh, one of the other things that gets built besides people are roads. And so I thought I would talk a little bit about roads. Um, I really like roads. Roads help you go fast. They make it smooth. Now, I love to go fast, and I love that roads can make it easy to go fast. Now, sometimes when you're going fast and you encounter a road, things don't go according to plan. Uh, recently, some of you may know, I crashed my bike uh, onto a road and ended up spending you know, several weeks on crutches and just now really kind of in the recovery process. But so, you know, roads are hard. You know, they're durable. They're, 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 they're made of hard materials, and they, they're durable. They last for a really long time. In fact, I was thinking about the, um, the roads that were built by the Roman Empire. Now, you may not know, but over 250,000 miles of roads were built by the Roman Empire. And some of those roads were in use for over 2,000 years. It's an incredible thing. And they built these roads to be durable. They built these roads to last a long time. They built roads to give guidance to the best destinations. You know, they say all roads lead to Rome. And they, they built roads that would lead to the best destinations. So you, you were on the road, you, could, you would know you'd be safe on the road. You had places where you could stay. Also, you may not know this, but Rome was actually known for having great signs. The Roman roads had great signs. It would be like, you know, this many more miles to get to this town or this many more miles to get to that town. Now, since most of you are in New Jersey and many of you live here, you probably don't realize that if you go elsewhere in the world, signs actually are helpful. And they will tell you not only where you are, but where you are going, maybe even with enough time to decide, do I need to make that turn or not? Not like the signs here in New Jersey. We know the signs in New Jersey are really bad. And, but, uh, but let me just uh, you know, reassure you, if you go elsewhere, signs are better. Um, some of the other things that, uh, you know, uh, things about the roads, I, you know, talking about the durability of the roads. When I was growing up, they, they had a road in front of my mom's house and they had to rebuild it every seven years or so. They, they'd put out tar and then they'd spread gravel on top of the tar and then they would take a steamroller and they'd run up and down the road trying to even out the gravel and the tar to kind of mush them together, sort of like making a s'more, you know what I mean? Like they had the marshmallow and the chocolate, and then they just kind of mushed it together to try to make, a, make it like a s'more. But it only lasted like seven years, as opposed to like a road made out of concrete that's durable and lasts a long time. You know, roads were critical for civilization, right? Once Rome started building roads, it made it possible for them for their transport people and supplies and get things to where they needed to go in a safe way. And it really had a major part in building of that civilization in Rome. In fact, even here in the United States, we find that we have the interstate highway system, which is again, designed to transport people and things very great distances. Now, you probably didn't think that I was gonna come here and talk all about roads, but I'm a nerd. I am, I'm a nerd. I really can sometimes get focused on the minutia of things. Like, you know, as people say, you can't see the forest for the trees. Sometimes I'm looking at moss. I'm looking at that little detail. But that's actually been a big part of my career. A big part of my career is that I look at the world differently. And somebody may come up to us and say, hey, here's a solution to the problem. This is what I want you to do. And I look at that solution and say, you know what? I'm not sure I'm gonna go that road. You might say I'm kind of known for taking the road less traveled. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Alex. So, you know, I mean, I know that was a really, really bad joke. And before you tell me to hit the road and go, let me get to the point. The point is that you probably are like me. You're probably one of those people in the world who looks at the world differently. You look at the world and you see a perspective that others may not have. Now, there's probably a number of reasons for that. One of the reasons for that is your intelligence, right? You guys are really smart. You know, what they say, half of the people in the world have below average intelligence, right? We all know that mathematically, that has to be true. And here you are, you're in the 80, 90th percentile of intelligence. So you're going to be those people who are gonna say, let's take the road less, tra less traveled. And so I wondered, 
How are you going to work that through in your career? You know, it's not so much true here at Stevens where you do have that sort of elevated intelligence and you have people who are at the same strong point as you are. But later on in your career, you're gonna be encountering people who just aren't as smart as you are. And they're just not gonna see the solutions that you're going to see. And the reason why the company is hiring you is because they think this person is smart. They're going to be able to think of a solution and they're gonna be able to find a way to solve problems that other people can't solve. And that's why we want to get a Stevens grad. And so you would, how are you going to work that out? You might be traveling down the car with somebody on a road and they may read the sign wrong, or they may, may have an opinion that they wanna go this particular direction because that's the way everybody went. And I think that's going to be something that you all will have to wrestle with in your careers. How do I navigate that along the path? Well, I wanna take you to uh, Jehoshaphat. Now, Jehoshaphat uh, is a king of Judah. So I wanna set the stage for you a little bit here on Jehoshaphat's life, because Jehoshaphat is one of the successful kings during the time, ancient time of Israel and Judah. He was one of the kings who chose to follow God. He's one of the kings who chose to look and say, okay, what path am I going to take I want to take the path that follows God. So in about 930 years before the birth of Jesus, the country of the kingdom of Israel was divided into two. It was divided into Judah and it was divided into Israel. Now Judah is where the Jehoshaphat becomes king. Now the interesting thing about that is that he's sort of a third king, right? So there was Jeroboam, and then there was, um, uh, I know Jer uh, Jehoshaphat's father was Asha, um, but I can't remember the na name of uh, his grandfather. But so he was the third one. And I will have to tell you that I learned Jehoshaphat's name from a guy called Yosemite Sam. Now Yosemite Sam used to say things like, jumpin' Jehoshaphat, I hate that long-eared varmint. Now, how many of you actually know who Yosemite Sam is? Wow, a lot more than I expected. You know, if you don't know who Yosemite Sam is, I want to reassure you, you're not missing anything. I mean, I was really sort of like subjected to Yosemite Sam because I was watching Bugs Bunny. It's kind of like watching Star Trek and having to put up with a Q episode. Although the nice thing about Q episodes is that all of the Q people all have the same name, Q. You didn't have to guess which one was Q because they were all Q. But, you know, and of course, now we're going to talk to you about Jehoshaphat, and I'm going to get his name wrong because I learned how to say his name from Yosemite Sam, but I think it's really pronounced Jehosh Jehoshaphat, but I'm going to get it wrong just so you know in advance. But anyway, the thing about Jehoshaphat is that he was a, 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 God, a king who decided he was going to follow God. So some of the ways in which he did that, one of the things he did is he fortified the cities. So after his father let him become the king. He fortified the cities of Judah. He wanted to protect the cities of Judah from invasion, and so he fortified them. He sent out uh, supplies. He sent out men. He sent out uh, to try to strengthen the cities in uh, Judah. The, another thing that he did is he sent out the, the team to go teach the people who God was and what God's word said. So he sent out teams of people to go and say, okay, here's what God's word says, and here's how you follow God. In Jehoshaphat's life, he wanted to follow God, but it wasn't enough for just for him to follow God. He wanted others to follow God too. And not just enough to say, oh, well, you should, but he actually went the next step to actually teach people, hey, this is how you follow God. One of the other things that he did was he tore down other forms of idol worship. He would look out in the countryside and say, okay, there's an Asherah. We're going to tear that down. There's an idol to Baal. We're going to tear that down. And he tore down these other ways in which people were following false gods to help them follow the one true God. In other words, Jehoshaphat was trying to get them to the right destination. Now, one of the other things um, that he was known for was... Um, when he set up a system of judges, he said to the, his people, okay, I want you to have justice. And so he set up a system of judges to be in, the, in, the, in, in Judah cities 
so that people, if they had disputes, they could go to somebody who would be wise. And I love the charge that he gave them in uh, Second Chronicles 19.6. He said, consider carefully what you do, because you are not judging mere mortals, but for the Lord, who is with you whenever you give a verdict. Now let the fear of the Lord be on you. Judge carefully, for with the Lord our God is no injustice or partiality or bribery. And I love that about Jehoshaphat. He's like, okay, I want to help people make wise decisions. I want to help there be justice. I want there to help there be mercy. I don't want corruption in my government. I don't want corruption in my towns. And so he is one of the, God, one of the kings who said, okay, I want to put an end to that as much as possible. Now, I'm painting a pretty rosy picture of Jehoshaphat. But I'll be honest with you, he wasn't all perfect. He wasn't perfect. He made a lot of different mistakes. You might say that he looked at some of the signs along the road and didn't take the path he should have taken. Now, one of the things that he did is he uh, created an alliance with the king Ahab. Now, as I said earlier, the, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. One was Judah and one was Israel. And Ahab was the king of Israel, but Ahab was not a good king. He did not encourage people to follow the Lord God. Instead, Ahab worked and actually killed or imprisoned many of the prophets of the Lord God. But despite the fact that Ahab had that terrible reputation, Jehoshaphat had his children marry Ahab's children. And as a result, he formed an alliance with the northern kingdom. And that was not really one of Jehoshaphat's great ideas. In fact, we're going to go to a story and where he is sitting with Ahab, and they are talking together, and um, Ahab says to Jehoshaphat, hey, I want you to go with me, and we're going to fight a battle at Ramoth Gilead. Let's go fight this battle at Ramoth Gilead together. And Jehoshaphat says, okay, we're family. Your, so, your soldiers and my soldiers will work together, and we'll go fight this battle together. But before we go, Jehoshaphat says, uh, first, let's seek the counsel of the Lord. So he committed to go with Ahab into this battle, but first he wanted to get the counsel of the Lord. And so uh, the king of Israel, Ahab, brought together the prophets. This is uh, 2 Chronicles 19, 18, verse 5. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, 400 men, and asked them, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I not? Go, they answered, for the God will give, the, give it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat asked, is there no longer a prophet of the Lord here whom we can inquire of? Now, one of the things I really love about this, there was a tremendous amount of peer pressure on Jehoshaphat. First of all, he was hanging out with King Ahab, right? His peer, like another king. There's a lot of pressure. He's, he's asking him to do something. You know, there's a lot of pressure there. Secondly, there was a lot of people who were saying, yes, absolutely, you should do this. And they had the 400 prophets that Ahab had gathered to say, yeah, we should do this, right? And then the, the pressure of, of all of that. And yet, despite that noise, despite the noise of peer pressure, despite the noise of the crowd, he said, we haven't heard from the voice of the Lord. And so he says to uh, Ahab, is there not a prophet of the Lord here? We should ask him the same question. You know, one of the things I wanted to know, though, is how did Jehoshaphat know that the 400 prophets that Ahab gathered were not speaking for the Lord? Because they clearly said that they were. They said, yes, God says that you should go into this battle. How do you think he knew that? I was trying to figure it out in my mind because there aren't really any clues in the, in the passage itself. It doesn't say that they all wore a badge that said, we're prophets of Baal. It doesn't say that they all wore a certain kind of costume or uniform. There was no obvious thing that was wrong. They don't have a patch on their eyes like a pirate. You know what I mean? There wasn't like anything obvious. And so I wondered to myself, what could have been the clue for Jehoshaphat to know that these 400 people, that they were not speaking for God? One of the commentaries I read said that 
it's not that they were necessarily not speaking for God, but they were not correctly speaking for God. In other words, I think that they were claiming to be prophets of the Lord God, but in fact, they were not. They were really rather wrong prophets or um, prophets who were misleading prophets, as opposed to really being like, you know, prophets for a different God. And I wonder, what, what was his clue? I think one of the clues might have been Ahab's reputation, right? Ahab already had a reputation for killing many of the prophets of the Lord God. So he probably knew that the men that Ahab would surround him with would not be the, the kind of men that would follow the Lord God. I think another clue that you find is that um, uh, is how uh, Ahab reacted. So uh, Jehoshaphat says, is there not a prophet of the Lord here? We could ask him the same question. The king of Israel replied to Jehoshaphat, there's one more man who could consult the Lord for us, but I hate him. He never prophesies anything but trouble for me. His name is Micaiah, the of, uh, son of Imlah. Computer's beeping. Anyway, <laughs> um, and so I think what you could take from that is that maybe Ahab was the kind of guy who surrounded himself with yes men. He surrounded with himself with people who were going to agree with him because the one that wouldn't agree with him, he had him in prison. And we, not so much here in the Chronicles passage, but in the, the King's passage that talks about this very same event, we hear that the prophet was actually in prison and they had to be taken out of prison in order to come and speak to the kings. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, quick, bring Micaiah, son of Imlah, over here. Now, one of the other things that is true about uh, uh, Micaiah is that his name was also used as one of the people that Jehoshaphat sent out to teach the people about the word of God. And the question I had was, are they the same person? But because this Micaiah was in prison, I don't believe so. I think that this is a different uh, person, but with the same name. Anyway, maybe they're part of the Q continuum. Who knows? Anyway, the, um, so the messenger, uh, verse 12 says, the messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, look, the other prophets without exception are predicting success for the king. Let your word agree with them and speak favorably. So the, the guy is saying, hey, you should say what all the other guys are saying. But Micaiah said, as surely as the Lord lives, I can only tell him what my God says. Now, Micaiah comes into the kings and he says this. When he arrived, the king asked of him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or shall I not? Attack and be victorious, he answered, for they will be given into your hand. But then the king said to him, how many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So somehow the way that Micaiah answered the king the first time, the king knew he was being sarcastic. He knew that he was not telling him the truth. And he pushed Micaiah. They have pushed Micaiah. Tell me the truth. I want to hear the truth. Don't tickle my ears with what another yes person is saying. I want to hear the truth. And so Micaiah does go on. He says, I saw all Israel scattered as the, on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, these people have no master. Let each one go to his home in peace. And so Micaiah goes on to say that if they go to battle against Ramoth Gilead, that King Ahab will be killed. He goes on to say that it will be a terrible destruction and that, they, uh, that the Lord is tricking using these 400 uh, invalid prophets to trick Ahab into going to battle against Ramoth Gilead. And in fact, that is what happens. Ahab actually dresses in a, in a soldier's costume, not in his kingly robes, so that he can uh, escape detection of the armies of Ramoth Gilead. And in fact, the armies of Ramoth Gilead see Jehoshaphat and say, oh, look, there goes the king. Let's get after him. But Jehoshaphat calls on the Lord's name and is rescued from that attack. And coincidentally, sort of by chance, the Bible kind of communicates, a soldier shoots King Ahab and he dies, just as the prophet had predicted. I think it's interesting that Jehoshaphat said yes to Ahab and then asked God what to do. 
And it, it's not really clear in the passage whether or not Jehoshaphat was being told by God to go with King Ahab or not. If you were to tell me that that was God's plan for King Ahab and he needed Jehoshaphat to go, I would probably say, okay, I can hear, see that reading. Or if you were to say, no, the things that the prophet said should have told Je Jehoshaphat, don't go. And I would say, yeah, that would be a fair reading of the passage as well. But the interesting thing about it is that he didn't ask God first. He said, yes. And then he asked God, what do you want to do? It's kind of interesting. I think I do that too. I think sometimes I make my plan and then I ask God to bless my plan. I think it's the other way around. I think we should ask God first and then follow God where he takes us. We can see how um, in this little thing, it's almost as if Jehoshaphat pulled over to ask for directions, right? But then didn't take them. Now, honestly, I have trouble stopping for directions. I like to go fast and I'm on the highway to go fast. And if I have to pull over, to ask for directions. That means all of the cars that I just spent an hour passing are now getting ahead of me again, and I'm gonna to have to pass them again. How many of you like to stop for directions? Like how many of you are good at it? Like, okay, I'm gonna stop for directions and I'm gonna get help. Who's good at that? Hardly any of us. Oh, more of you knew who Yosemite Sam was than that will stop for directions. You're just like me, I just won't stop for directions. And here I think Jehoshaphat, sort of stop for directions and said, nah, that's wrong. I'm going to do my own thing. Anyway, we do discover that it wasn't what God wanted. Uh, in 2 Chronicles 19, uh, it says this, when King Jehoshaphat of Judah arrived safely home in Jerusalem, Jehu, son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him. Why would you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? He asked the king. Because of what you've done, the Lord is very angry with you. So here is clear. The prophet has come to Jehoshaphat and says, hey, that was not what, I, what God wanted you to do. But I love how Jehoshaphat responds. Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem, but he went out among the people, traveling from Bathsheba to the hill country of Ephraim, encouraging the people to return to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. He took that correction. He, he was told, nope, you did it wrong. And he changed. Now, I think that's hard to do too. And I can remember so many times realizing I'm wrong, but not wanting to have to really admit that I'm wrong. I remember one time I was, I don't know, eight years old, nine years old. And I was sitting at the table of my friend and his little brother came wearing a hat to, the, to sit and have dinner. And at that time, it was impolite to wear hats at dinner. So I said to my buddy's little brother, I said, oh, you're wearing your hat at dinner. You shouldn't wear your hat at dinner. If you do, you'll go bald. <laughs> I was wrong about that. But I mean, it's just repeating something I'd heard and trying to convince them, you know, but I just went on blithely just continuing to say that that's what's why he should wear his hat is because he would go bald. You know, he's what, three, four years old. He's not going to go bald because he's wearing a hat. But I was just so stubborn that I didn't want to admit I was wrong about what I had said. I love how Jehoshaphat is willing to admit that he was wrong and change what he did. Instead of going and trying to help Ahab get better and be stronger and fight these battles, Instead, he put his energy into helping his people and teaching them about the word of God and helping them to set up these centers of justice. So I love that about him. You know, it's like he finally saw the sign that said, go back, wrong way, and turned around and actually did. There's another time in Jehoshaphat's life where he did something similar. Um, he was at home in Jerusalem and the crowds of people came and said, hey, Somebody is coming to, to fight you. And it, it says here, it was the, uh, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Minneites uh, came to war, wage war with Jehoshaphat. And he was so concerned about this that he said, okay, stop. All of Judah, we're going to stop. Whatever we're doing, we're going to take a fast. 
And we're going to ask God, what do you want to do about this incredible army that is two, three times the size of our army? There's no way we can win this battle. God, what do you want us to do? And God told him what to do. He told him that, you know what? You're not going to have to fight this battle. I'm fighting this battle for you. You don't need to go to war. I'm going to go to war for you. And so all you need to do is just go and deploy your, 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 your armies and see how I'm going to do this for you. But I love what he does in the midst of that. So he's got all this fear. He's got all this trepidation. He's been told by God not to fight the battle. And he says this in the Second Chronicles 20, verse 21. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord, to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. What I love about that is that in the midst of the trial, before it's solved, in the midst of the fear, before he knew what God was going to do, when it was taking him a step of faith to follow God, I'm sure his feelings and his advisors were saying, no, that's not how you win a battle. But he took that step of faith. He decided, I am going to follow God. And in the midst of the fear, he praises God for God's character, God's nature, who God is. It's as if he had such a durable foundation of who God is and what God's character was that he could praise God in the midst of a trial, in the midst of trouble, in the midst of being afraid. You know, that foundation that he laid of the word, that foundation of listening for God's voice, was that foundation. He knew the character of God. And so he was able to say in the midst of trouble, I'm going to praise God and I'm going to have my people praise him. Now, you may know the rest of that story. They get there and those armies defeated themselves. And it took like three or four days for them to collect all of the spoils from that war, even though they did not fight one man, not fight one soldier. And so uh, that's an incredible uh, miracle that God did. But again, he went out praising God before he knew how God was going to work out that miracle. So I really like that about Jehoshaphat. So anyway, there's a lot, that's a long summary of his life and we haven't gotten to everything. But returning to the theme of the road to Christ, we see that Jehoshaphat's life demonstrates many of the aspects of a road. One of the things is that the road to Christ is durable. Here we are, over 2,000 years later, almost 3,000 years later, and we're still talking about him. We know his name. We know his, what happened to him. His life was durable on the road to Christ. In fact, as many of you know that his name is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, Matthew 1, verse 8. He's mentioned as one of the fathers or grandfathers or great, 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 great grandfathers of Jesus Christ. Now, we know that he wasn't perfect. And we see many times when he went the wrong way. We, he set up the alliance with Ahab. He went to battle with Ahab. He let his children marry Ahab's children. Um, there's another story where he makes an alliance with the second king of Israel, uh, Ahab's son. And they have a, a thing that they're trying to do together. And that all goes out into, into disaster because Ahab's son was just as corrupt as, as Ahab. We see over and over again that he, it's not that he was perfect. He made many mistakes, but I want to point out one common theme in all of those mistakes. One of the aspects, and that is, don't establish alliances with those who do not follow, share your faith in God. That was the thing that we see Jehoshaphat do over and over again, was establishing these alliances. And I think you know, we probably not many of us here are going to establish alliances with other kingdoms. And nobody here is probably going to set up a military alliance, I don't think. Maybe. Who knows where the path may take you. But many of you will have a chance to make an alliance with one other person. And that would be the person that you marry. And I want to just sort of underscore that this account, this sign, this do not enter, do not pass go. This sign says, when you are making that alliance, don't make your alliance with somebody 
who does not share your faith in Jesus Christ. There's a, there's a passage uh, about this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16. Do not team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And so I just want to say this really frankly. Do not marry somebody who does not share your faith in Jesus Christ. Just, I'm saying it plain out flatly. If we had a little bit more time, I'd show you this little demonstration about how hard it is to pull somebody up onto the chair that you're standing on and how easy it is for somebody to pull you off of a chair. And that image might help you to see how getting in those alliances with somebody who is not at the same relationship status with God can cause you to have times of destruction, have times of trouble, like it did for Jehoshaphat. But Jehoshaphat did many things that were good, many things that were right. And as I said, he's considered to be one of the kings who did follow the Lord God. Now, I would like you to think for yourself, what areas in your life could you say yes to God? I mean, one of the things that Jehoshaphat did is he was listening for God's voice so he could say yes to God. He didn't always say yes to God, but he was listening for God's voice so he could say yes to God. He listened by listening to God's word. He listened by listening to God's prophets. He listened by asking God, hey, what should I do? How should I handle this circumstance? He listened so he could say yes. Now I ask you, what area in your life do you need to say yes to God? I'm sure there's something in right now that you're thinking of that you're thinking, I should say yes to God about this. I'll give you a couple samples of my own life. Recently, it came to my understanding that I needed to spend more time reading God's word. Now I read God's word a fair amount, but I needed to spend more time. I needed to allocate an additional 15 minutes to reading God's word. And so I'm making that commitment to try to read God's word an additional 15 minutes during the day. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I want to be able to understand and hear God's voice. I've said this before to you. Isn't it cool how Jehoshaphat was able to hear that God's voice was not being spoken by the 400 prophets of Ahab? How did he know? Because he recognized God's voice. How did he recognize God's voice? By spending time reading God's word. And I want to encourage, maybe that's where you need to say yes. That's where I need to say yes recently. Maybe at one of the places you need to say yes is to say yes and spend more time talking to God. Now, a lot of times we talk to God in prayer. We're, we're bringing him a list of things that we want for him to do for us. And we see that in Jehoshaphat's life too, right? He brings this, he call, declares a fast in Judah because of the crisis of having all of these kings attack him. But we don't have to have that kind of relationship where we only come to God when we're needing something or we only come to God when we're in crisis. Maybe God is saying to you, hey, Come and spend time with me and just talk to me about what's going on in your life. Tell me about your feelings. Tell me about your thoughts. Tell me what you're thinking about, what, what's going on. Don't come to me with a list of things. Just come to me in that relationship, in that conversation, and just spend time talking with him in that way. Maybe for some of you, your yes to God needs to be your first yes to God. Right? You've heard this truth, that God is pursuing you, that God loves you, that God cares about you, and he wants to have an intimate relationship with you, a relationship where you can come and talk to him and tell him about what's going on in your life. But you haven't yet really said yes to God. Maybe you're still waiting. And I just want to say, this might be the day where you can say that yes to God, where you say to God, yes, I admit that most of my life has lived in rebellion to you that I haven't followed you with most of my life, but that I want to accept what Jesus did on my behalf and accept the forgiveness that you extend to me through what Jesus did for me. And so God, I'm going to say yes to you and I'm going to follow you with my life. So right now, actually, I'm gonna just take a second here. I'm gonna take a second to pray. And then as I pray, I'm gonna say, Father, we pray. I'm gonna be quiet for just a few moments for you to spend some time talking to God about what you want to say to yes to him about. 
And maybe you'll even say to him, I'm not ready to say yes, but this is what I'm thinking about. That's okay too. He can take your conversation wherever it's at. And we'll just spend a minute. And then after a few moments of silence, while you're praying quietly where you are, I'll wrap us up in the end. How does that sound? Will you pray with me? Father, um, I'm really grateful for the way in which you pursue us, the way in which you love us, and how you show us many different ways that you are leading us in this path to knowing who Jesus Christ is. And so we're grateful for all the different ways and all the different signs, all the different ways in which you communicate to us. And so now, Father, we're just coming back to you and we just wanna figure out how we can say yes to you. What is it that we should say yes to? What are you calling us to? We wanna spend a minute to listen and then spend a minute to say yes. So Father, we pray. Dad, thank you for these men and women. Thank you that they are here tonight or listening via Zoom in order to hear what you have to say to them. And I'm grateful that you are pursuing each one and that you love each one. And as they turn their hearts to you to figure out how they can say yes to you, I ask God that you will speak clearly to them and that you'll give them the courage and the strength to say yes you give them the discipline to follow through and do what they say yes to, that you give them those reminders and those, those places of encouragement, wherever it might be, so they can follow you with their whole hearts. We are grateful for your love and the way you keep pouring it out on us. You do such a great job of taking care of us, and for that, we are grateful. And so, Father, we say yes. Amen. Thank you very much.